Hi, welcome to our joint webinar with Rewiring America, um, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, Investments for Tribal and Indigenous Communities. My name is Kailea Frederick, and I'm a climate justice organizer with NDN Collective. NDN Collective is an Indigenous-led organization dedicated to building Indigenous power through organizing, grant making, philanthropy, and capacity building. And before we get into the bulk of the webinar, I wanted to provide just a little bit of context on the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act, otherwise known as the IRA, uh, which I think we've all agreed that it's a terrible acronym, <laughs> um, it was only just signed into law in August, and it's the biggest climate bill in the history of the United States. Um, and, you know, we can't ignore that the IRA is controversial, controversial for frontline communities, um, but it's also undoubtedly drives historic investment into our communities. So here at NDN, we believe in building indigenous power through developing indigenous led regenerative and sustainable solutions. And so we know it's critical that these funds and programs are distributed and implemented in equitable ways to our people and communities. So just to say it simply, there is a huge amount of money that's available for tribes and indigenous communities to help us achieve climate justice, um, which is why we additionally co-authored a memo with Rewiring America um, that also outlines all of the funds directed specifically to tribal and indigenous communities and the additional billions that we are eligible to apply for. Um, so that's really what we are going to get into during this webinar um, with Jamal Lewis and Jade Begay, who are going to be overviewing what exactly is in the IRA, eligibility requirements, including some barriers that might exist so that we can make sure that we're advocating together for more accessibility, um, the timeline of some of the implementation, and some of the key themes and issue areas that are applicable to our communities. Um, and so before I pass it over to Jamal to introduce himself and give a, a brief little overview on rewiring America um, and also kick us off into the rest of the webinar, we are going to do a quick poll, which is just a helpful way to get a sense of where everyone is at regarding this topic. Um, so let's see here. Great. Okay, so Jade's helping me out. So we, you can hopefully this popped up on your screen. The question is, how familiar are you with the Inflation Reduction Act? Um, and so, just real simple, very familiar, somewhat familiar, or I have no idea what the IRA is, which is fine because we're all here to learn together this evening. Um, but we would love for you to um, click one of those, and we can see see who's in the room with us right now. And Jade, I think you're going to have to read real time results, maybe on your end, because I can't see them on my end. Got it. OK, so the results are strongly in the side of I think I can end the poll and then share the results. So can people see those? I can. Great. So there you have it. I think we're, yeah, somewhat familiar. Um, for the most part, but it's great to see that there is variation and <clears throat> that's why we're here as Kailea said. So thanks everyone for participating in that, in that poll. <laughs> and without further ado, I'd love to pass it over to you, Jamal. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate it and um, I really appreciate uh, our partnership as well. Um, uh, I am Jamal Lewis. I work with uh, Rewiring America. Uh, we were founded uh, based on the premise that uh, we uh, don't have a lot of time to address our, our climate crisis. Um, uh, and for many reasons, um, we, uh, we have to essentially uh, peak our fossil fuel emissions and pollution uh, by 2025 in order to, to have a shot at limiting warming. But that's not the only reason. 
uh, fossil fuel pollution uh, has uh, for a long time and continues to to this day uh, negatively impact uh, various communities, communities uh, that look like me, uh, communities of color, black and brown communities, um, but also uh, in uh, to probably a, a, a greater degree, uh, tribal and indigenous uh, and, and native communities uh, also. So our uh, organization uh, was founded uh, to uh, recognizing that about half of our, our, our uh, the, the emissions uh, from the United States comes from uh, decisions that consumers make, uh, decisions that uh, each of us uh, have the power to make. And that is with regards to uh, how we heat and cool our homes, how we uh, heat and cool our, our uh, water as well, in addition to uh, what we use to, to cook our food uh, and to get us places. So talking about um, our heating systems, our stoves and ovens, uh, as well as uh, cars, public transportation, um, these are all machines that for a long time have run on fossil fuels uh, and have contributed to uh, the broader fossil fuel um, uh, pollution that has contributed to climate change. Uh, what uh, I think what uh, a lot of people, what I realize that a lot of people don't uh, know or aren't, haven't been exposed to is that there are uh, cleaner zero emissions versions of, of, of these technologies. Uh, there are uh, electric uh, versions of these technologies. Many of you may, may be aware of things like electric vehicles uh, that are hitting the market, but there are similar types of um, like efficient electric appliances that we can use in our homes too. Things like heat pumps, uh, induction stoves, um, heat pump water heaters. Um, these are all uh, appliances that if we were to switch out the 1 billion machines in, uh, in the United States uh, that run on fossil fuels to efficient electric ones, we can address uh, over half of our country's emissions. Um, so that's basically what Rewiring America is. <clears throat> and we've been uh, very uh, active in trying, in trying to help people understand how we can uh, electrify, that's switching from fossil fuels to electric, uh, electric energy, um, and how we can do that through the incentives uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, focusing uh, specifically on uh, the incentives that are, are uh, for tribal communities. I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> so uh, let me skip that part. So what is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act? The Inflation Reduction Act is a, a piece is a is a bill uh, a piece of legislation that was uh, passed by uh, Congress uh, back in August and then signed by the president um, in September. Uh, this uh, this bill included uh, uh, a massive investment in the uh, the energy infrastructure uh, uh, across our country. Uh, this includes how we generate power. This includes distribution of power. Uh, and this also includes things like what I was talking about, like consumer incentives to switch to zero emissions technologies in our home. Uh, this is not only the, the uh, you know, a massive investment in our energy infrastructure, it's the largest investment uh, in climate change that, our, uh, that the United States government has ever uh, passed. Um, there's $369 billion for upgrading and transitioning to clean, uh, renewable uh, electric energy. So, what, so what's, in, what's in this bill for tribal and native communities? Uh, there is uh, something that we like to call the electrification rebates. Electrification, again, switching from fossil fuel machines to electric machines. Uh, and there are incentives to help uh, people, people like you and I, uh, do that for our own homes. Uh, so you can see here the first uh, bullet, there's $225 million available for tribes uh, to subsidize the cost of purchasing, 
uh, a heating system, an electric heating system, as well as installing an electric heating system. And these are intended to be at point of sale, which means, you know, if you're going to the store to purchase a heating system, the cost of that, uh, the cost of your purchase is intended to go down as a result of this, uh, this rebate. We call that point of sale. It's essentially an upfront discount. The, this, these are uh, really exciting uh, incentives, uh, not only because they're consumer incentives that help us uh, afford, uh, better afford clean air technologies for our homes, but also uh, because how we heat and cool our homes, the machines that we use, also determine and help to influence where that power supply comes from, the, you know, the, uh, the production uh, and generation of, uh, of energy uh, that, uh, of electricity that ultimately flows into our homes. If our entire home is, is running on electricity, that opens up the, uh, the possibility for us to be powering our homes with renewable energy sources like solar, wind, uh, geothermal. So I'm not going to go too deep into the details here, but what I will say uh, is that this is a really important uh, incentive program that is going to be administered uh, by tribes. And those tribes have not been uh, named yet. Uh, and when they are, I'll make sure that uh, Indian Collective has that information. They may also uh, get it before I do. So either way, you all will, will get that information soon. Also, uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there is uh, $150 million for an electrification program. Uh, this, will, this program, $150 million, will help connect tribes and Native communities to electricity, uh, particularly ones that don't already have it, uh, electricity. And it will, it will help communities switch from fossil fuels to clean electricity. Um, so that is also a really important uh, program and incentive uh, that I think is going to have a transformative uh, impact on uh, on your communities. Uh, there's also this tribal climate resilience program. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of detail uh, in the bill itself, but what we do know is that this this re these resources are intended to help tribes and native communities uh, adapt to climate change um, and become more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Uh, and that includes fish hatcheries. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, what is intended behind the fish, hatch fish hatchery part, uh, but know that that's part of this cl tribal climate resilience program. There's also money both for uh, climate resilience for native Hawaiians, uh, as well as emergency drought relief for tribes. And I'm, I will make sure that you all uh, can get access to these resources, um, but I'm just going to run through these uh, fairly quickly so we have more time for, for questions. Um, there is this Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program. Uh, it's, uh, this program is intended to help install uh, energy uh, sources in various tribal communities. So think about you know, solar farms or um, transmission to help connect renewable energy sources to your community, like those type of big, massive scale projects that cost a lot of money and, and that often require financing. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act allocated $75 million to help guarantee some of those loans um, uh, for, you know, for these really important investments. Specifically, tribal energy development organizations uh, are the entities that are eligible to, re to receive uh, these loan guarantees. So those are the provisions that are specifically and in intentionally intended for tribal and native communities. We're also gonna talk a little bit about what provisions uh, that tribal and native communities are eligible for. Uh, because we want you all to, to get access to as much of that uh, as, as possible as well. So um, there is a provision called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. There's a lot of detail to this program, 
that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but what I will say is that uh, there's $27 billion. This is the largest like non-tax program in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and it's intended to serve uh, low income and disadvantaged communities. Uh, I don't love either of those terms. Those terms are both in the bill, uh, so it's, it's hard to get around it. But the term disadvantaged communities does include tribal and native uh, and indigenous communities. So uh, fifth, 7 billion of uh, this 27 billion is intended to help you all install uh, and get connected to solar, uh, which is a zero emissions way of generating energy. $8 billion is intended to help establish and install other types of zero emissions technologies. Could be things like induction stoves or uh, electric heat pumps or geothermal energy. Uh, that's what the $8 billion is for. And the $12 billion is intended to help support fin financing institutions that will help uh, native and residents of na uh, native tribal and indigenous communities gain access to resources in, in the form of financing to help, uh, to help, part uh, help you all participate in this clean energy transition. Those financing entities can take the form of a green bank, um, which is essentially a bank to help with uh, uh, it, uh, green energy solutions uh, or community development financing institutions that help in, uh, that help build and advance projects like affordable housing or uh, parks um, or other sort of commercial buildings. Those types of financing institutions uh, are also an eligible entity here. The goal behind this fund is that the financing that's deployed, when it when that is paid back, is supposed to be a revolving loan fund to help to continue to help uh, and sustainably help uh, households access uh, both renewable energy and zero emissions technologies over time. So, if we do this right, this fund will last a very long time and will continue to help households transition. There are, uh, there's a lot of resources to help reduce air pollution writ large. Uh, the climate pollution reduction grants are grants for uh, states, tribes, states and tribes to help both plan out air pollution reduction opportunities, as well as implement those, those projects and opportunities. Uh, so that's a really important program because we often don't get funding for planning. Um, so I will, uh, you know, say that, that I think that's going to be a really important tool for you all, um, you know, as you're transitioning. There's a $3 billion flexible pot of money that is uh, available for tribes uh, to address environmental justice issues. So this is broader, this is inclusive of climate, but is, is much broader than climate as well. So thinking about um, wastewater treatment or hazardous waste sites, um, that $3 billion is, is, is broadly intended to, to address uh, environmental issues in your communities. So definitely leverage that uh, if you can. And then ports, there's, you know, about three, a little over $2 billion, actually $3 billion for ports uh, to help reduce air pollution there. Um, so moving on, I think I have a couple more slides and then I'll kick it back over, uh, I think, to Jade. There are uh, pro programs for uh, coastal communities to help build climate resilience uh, in the face of rising sea levels. Uh, so there is resources for that, as well as to help conserve our forests, which we, uh, which are an important tool to help keep carbon in the ground and not uh, release carbon into our atmosphere. And then there's also when we think about like transportation facilities like train stations or um, uh, other uh, like car hubs, um, those types of facilities, when you think about the actual structure of that facility, there is a lot of a lot of fossil fuels likely went into the construction of that facility. So this pot of money is available to help 
build uh, these types of transportation uh, facilities uh, using as little carbon as possible, um, which will help us in the long term reduce our, our air pollution. So the Inflation Reduction Act includes a lot of like grants and loans and financing, but it also includes a lot of tax credits too. So these are uh, these are uh, investments that you can claim on your you know when you file your taxes uh, that allow you to get uh, a credit back for those investments. A lot of the tax credits, uh, unfortunately, are not um, direct direct to consumer. There's often an intermediary like a developer uh, or a nonprofit or a state or a local government um, that uh, can claim these credits. But ultimately, there are a lot of credits that are intended to like where the benefits are intended to flow down to the community. And this set in this 48 credit is one of them. Uh, there, as a result of this this act, this bill, there's going to be a lot more solar that is constructed, a lot more wind energy, geothermal, uh, and other sources of renewable energy uh, that are uh, going to be put into the market. We want that those that energy those energy sources to be connected to as many of our communities as possible, uh, particularly those who are uh, underserved and often have. Uh, often pay a lot of, of money for their their utility bills. So this 48 credit is uh, a tax credit for developers and investors that you know that support and build uh, these types of energy generation renewable energy generation facilities. But there's an enhanced credit for those facilities that end up with a connection to uh, low income communities as well as uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, and you can see there in bolded, which also includes Indian land. So this tax credit is going to drive more renewable energy sources to be directed towards uh, your communities. There is uh, this uh, commercial buildings deduction, it, tax deduction It's really uh, a credit that allows commercial buildings to transition and install more efficient, zero emissions technologies. Um, and then again, this clean electrification uh, in, uh, investments credit uh, is another, uh, actually, I think this should be clean energy investments credit. Sorry about that. But it is a, uh, it's another credit that's supportive uh, of clean energy. And there's an additional adder uh, for those that are either located in or connected to uh, Indian land. And what I don't want uh, you all to, I don't want to leave here without mentioning that there are, there as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act, there is, uh, there are two consumer uh, tax credits for, uh, for individuals like you, uh, you all and myself. Electric vehicles are uh, the future of cars. Um, there's going to be a lot more cars that are produced that are electric. Um, and you'll you'll start to see a lot more cars on the road that are electric. Um, uh, until, uh, well, electric cars right now are considered to be a luxury item uh, that, are, that are very expensive and uh, inaccessible to individuals like, like us, um, oftentimes. What this bill does is it creates a credit, a tax credit, that lowers the cost uh, that um, essentially makes purchasing electric vehicles more accessible uh, for under-resourced households. There are cost limits, price limits for uh, um, vehicles that qualify for the credit. So $55,000 for sedans, $80,000 for vans, trucks, and sport and SUVs. Uh, taking $7,500 uh, $7, off of that is still a lot of money. And I recognize that, um, and it also is still more accessible too. I think both can be true at the same time. And then there's also a credit for the used for used electric vehicles. Right now, uh, mo I think most folks are buying their e the electric vehicles or EVs new, um, but eventually there's going to be a thriving used electric vehicle market where folks can buy buy their cars used. This uh, 
uh, there is now a tax credit that lowers the, the cost of those used electric vehicles, which I think is also going to help uh, all of us transition to clean electric energy. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this last slide uh, talks about uh, the fact that some of these tax credits are now available for tribal governments to leverage, um, which allows uh, uh, these governments to receive uh, and to pass on the value of the credits uh, to others, which I'm not going to go into all of the details, but it essentially makes uh, investments more accessible uh, for, for all of us and also uh, allows uh, the value of those credits to reach those who need it most. So I won't go too deep into that. Um, so, so quickly, timelines. Uh, so the bill passed uh, in August and was signed in September. All of the programs that I mentioned today, and I apologize for, for zooming through them so quickly, uh, you'll get these resources. But the federal agencies responsible for each of those programs are now in the process of uh, soliciting uh, public comment on how those programs should be implemented. That process, depending on the program, could take, you know, through the next year. Uh, and so organizations and individuals like uh, myself, Growing America, Indian Collective, uh, are in the process of uh, commenting and, and actually providing public comment on these programs, our main goal is to make sure that these programs are as accessible as possible for those who need it most, particularly folks who haven't been able to access these resources in the past. And I know a lot of tribal and native and indigenous communities haven't been able to do that. So that is our primary focus. Um, and we will continue to fight to make sure that uh, these, these resources ultimately end up in the hands of, of individuals and, and communities and households that need it most. After the federal government comment periods, a lot of these programs will, will go to tribes, the tribal government, um, or the tribal government will need to apply for these resources. That, will, that is another opportunity to have uh, all of your voices heard. You should be telling the tribal, your, your, your government or ent the entity that is overseeing your community what you want these resources to be used for and how you want them to deploy these resources. That is uh, your right. And uh, we want as many people uh, to be weighing in on this implementation as possible. Those are really the top two opportunities for getting your input in. After that, uh, is when these resources will start to flow to our communities. Uh, so it might take some time for these resources to, to, to actually start benefiting us, um, but these resources are coming and we want uh, the people who need it most uh, to be prepared to leverage. Uh, I think one thing that I know Jade and I have talked about is oftentimes we're so busy fighting against bad things in our communities, which is really important, but it takes up mental energy uh, and and oftentimes prevents us from preparing to reap the benefits of, of good things uh, or, or good resources or incentives that could come to our communities too. So recognize uh, that that's hard um, and it takes a lot of energy and time, uh, but we're, we're trying to, uh, to do that uh, on our end uh, and want you all to engage with us. Uh, sorry, I do have two more slides, but these last two are just guides to help and resources to help you all understand more what's in this Inflation Reduction Act. So we have a guide that's on our website. I'll put that in the chat once I take my slides down. And then we have a calculator that will help you understand uh, what's in your electric bank account to help you transition to clean, renewable, zero emission uh, technologies. So I'll stop there. Uh, and really, really sorry for uh, talking so fast, but I, I wanna leave some time for questions. All good, Jamal. I think, yeah, we need to hear it over and over again to let it really sink in because it's it's a lot of information and it's it's really wonky and it's made that way, right? It's these, yeah, this this type of work is 
hard to translate and it's it's kind of boring and it's not glamorous but um yeah at least the language and the implementation part of it but um i think when we can really begin to imagine and wrap our heads around the benefits of this type of resourcing into our communities then it gets really exciting so that's what i'm going to try to do in this next five, 10 minutes or so. Um, thanks for sharing that tool. I just saw on Twitter, someone utilize, like a citizen utilize Rewiring America's tool to calculate, yeah, if they could put some well, new appliances and um, new panels on their home. And it was just really cool to see just like, you know, your quote unquote, average Joe, use that tool and, and figure out whether or not they can do that this year. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that tool. I think it went to all the attendees. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just talking to the panelists, but we're going to share that out with everyone. It's the um, IRA calculator. And that's what I was just talking about. Um, so just transitioning over like I said, I'm going to try and talk about the um, the benefits specifically to our communities kind of on, on our own terms, right? Um, and let's see if I can make this a little bit more, um, I don't know, helpful in, in viewing, because I think you can only see the slide, the top slide. Um, Give me one moment. Okay, well, either way, <laughs> this is the way we're viewing it right now. Um, I'm not the most tech savvy. <clears throat> All right, so um, yeah, like I said, just wanting to move through um, some of what Jamal sh shared and kind of bring it down to um, the level of yeah, what does this mean on the ground? What does this mean applied in our own communities? Uh, before I get there, I just wanted to share some thoughts around how utilizing and taking advantage of the benefits within the IRA is helping us build indigenous power. So um, Jamal was just talking about the importance of engagement in this process of implementation or in this period of implementation. Um, it's really important that we engage so that we are strengthening equity and building equity in this process. So as I shared in this point, um, it's just important to engage because it's an opportunity to drive resources, not only to our tribal communities, but beyond, right, to our indigenous communities, and that's why there needs to be some advocacy there. Um, but yeah, to grow to grow solutions and to develop solutions on our own terms um, that are solutions that are culturally and ecologically relevant to the unique needs of our people, um, we need to be involved and we need to be guiding how these funds are utilized, um, and and how they get to our communities. And then the piece around, uh, just to say more about the, the piece around um, expanding beyond tribes, this is something that <clears throat> the NDN team has been really active in as far as um, really making sure that agencies and the Biden administration know that it's important to fund not only tribal, governments and tribal communities uh, that are federally recognized, but that we need investments to go beyond that. And it's really important, you know, we we do our advocacy, that's part of our, our job, but we need citizens, we need tribal leaders, we need tribal community members, especially to engage on this front too. So um, the piece around uh, engagement, it, it's just important for folks to show up there. And that's a real, that, that can have a real impact. And I, I think oftentimes it, um, it's not always talked about in our organizing work, 
uh, but it's it's key. It's key, especially if we want resources to uh, to meet our people on the ground. Um, and then I wanted to talk about some of the infrastructure and uh, highlight some of the infrastructure needs in Indian country. So um, we know that 75% of unelectrified homes in the United States are located on tribal lands. Um, so when we're talking about, yeah, all the resources available um, in the IRA to electrify communities, um, to bring uh, new appliances or retrofitting into our communities, that's a huge opportunity there to meet that gap and to bring more equity into our communities when it comes to access to energy. And we know that when we have access to energy, it can be a game changer for, for our communities. Um, it can be a game changer for how we advocate for ourselves in the long term. Um, you know, if a home is not electrified, they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have broadband. So how they're, you know, engaging with the larger community around advocacy issues, like all of those things get changed. So yeah, huge opportunity here. Um, this next point, tribal communities suffer from higher costs of service, higher interconnection um, fees, more blackouts and brownouts, which um, uh, are, are related to the energy companies uh, reducing, reducing when or maybe uh, yeah, having a blackout because of different energy issues. Um, so yeah, there, there's we experience those um, in our communities. Um, and of course, you know, we all know the issues that come with being in remote and rural places. Um, I think this point here around the CDC uh, providing us data that between 20, uh, 2004 to uh, 2018, American Indian and Alaska Native people had the highest rates of heat related death followed by our black relatives. I think when we're talking about Jamal had mentioned um, using IRA funds for uh, appliances like heat pumps. Um, the name is a little confusing because they of course can provide heat, but a huge benefit from heat pumps is that they also provide cooling. Um, and so making sure that we're taking advantage of programs to get heat pumps into our house, into our homes, um, and communities can really affect um, this this type of statistic, uh, where it's it's just uh, a huge inequity that you know we are facing as climate as the climate crisis continues to get worse and worse. Um, and also, as we know, a lot of our tribal uh, our tribal homes were built uh, through programs that you know just kind of quickly quickly made these homes, and they're not really built um, for the for the types of changes we're seeing in our climates. Um, often there isn't really great ventilation. Um, oftentimes, almost always, I know in my res, um, I'm from Tsuke Pueblo, a lot of the homes don't have any kind of AC. So yeah, having taking advantage of the program to address these types of inequities is really important. Um, and then a last little, uh, point I'll make is that 49% um, of tribal homes do not have access to reliable water resources, clean drinking water, or basic sanitation. Um, through EJ block grants, through different provisions that Jamal mentioned today, this is another area of work that we can apply resources to and strengthen the, infra the water infrastructure in our communities. So that this just outlines some of the, the needs, which I'm sure all of you all are very aware of, but just to emphasize like what the dollars can be used to address. And there's there's so many more issues, right? So this is just a um just a few points. Um and then I wanted to talk about elevating indigenous-led solutions and traditional knowledge. So we mentioned the funds, and this is a little repetitive. You know, Jamal talked about the 
$10 million for fish hatchery operations and maintenance. This is this is supported, this type of resourcing can be supportive to TEK or traditional ecological knowledge when it comes to um, developing or maintaining and uh, making sure that our, our fish hatcheries and our fish operations in our tribal communities are, are thriving. Um, in addition, there's the 220 million for tribal climate resilience and adaptation programs. Um, that's a broad term. Those are broad terms, resilience and adaptation. But you know, you all know what what that is. Like you, yeah, if you're engaged in climate work, if you're working on the ground, you know that that translates into forestry programs. I'm thinking of people engaged in uh, land management, forest management work to make sure that we're, you know, clearing our forests to prevent wildfire. That's the type of programming that this, this type of funding can support. Also thinking of like um, with this other pot of funding over here, the 2.6 billion investment into coastal communities and climate resilience. Thinking of the work that's happening in Alaska with um, uh, kelp farming. That's a climate solution. That's TEK, that's traditional ecological knowledge in practice, um, you know, sequestering carbon, but also at the same time, uh, increasing food sovereignty and a regional local economy for the folks in those communities. Um, some other type of, some other kinds of TEK or indigenous led solutions, you know, irrigation programs or irrigation projects, um, strategies to maintain or protect wetlands. Uh, these are all the types of programs that, you know, fall under resilience and adaptation or, um, yeah, yeah, resilience and adaptation. So just wanted to break that down because I think sometimes, like I was saying earlier, we can get lost in the verbiage or lost in the language of these big wonky policy packages, but when applied on the ground, it really is um, uplifting the work that we, a lot of the times our, our communities are already doing. Um, so in, in this spirit, I just really wanna emphasize you know, reaching out to indigenous organizations um, who are doing this type of work, farmers, uh, any an indigenous organization involved in uh, elevating and building renewable energy in the communities, um, ranchers who know, uh, you know, who who are in, who know the impacts and who are familiar with the impacts of drought. There's um, some funding in the IRA for drought relief. Um, so yeah, begin to you know spread the word and 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 encourage people to start building relationships like tribes and organizations like NDN working together um, to create pathways to hold those resources. That's something we need to be building now. Um, so just really encouraging, yeah, the uh, having the conversations in your in your communities, in your networks, in your tribes, around what kind of partnerships are needed to distribute and hold these these, these resources and manage these resources. Um, so this is the last slide I had, and I just wanted to emphasize the last uh, the last few. Um, points and um, kind of next steps that Jamal shared, which was sign up for newsletters um, so that you can stay tuned um, for more webinars, for more outreach around navigating and accessing the IRA funds, um, engaging in the public comment periods. Uh, we will be sending a newsletter around uh, what those are in the coming week. Uh, so that's one way to engage, or if we are in this work together, feel free to reach out to us so we can partner on those public comments. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, begin to talk to your tribal leaders, your tribal, um, uh, the people working in your tribes, in the environmental programs, in the energy programs, 
and and like I said, begin to have those conversations about partnership. So uh, that's all I got for now, and we'll move over to Q and A. Um, I yeah, there are a lot of really great questions, and so. Um, I, I, I think both of you are able to see the Q, you know, what people have dropped in the Q&A. And so I think between the two of you, if you want to um, pick a few to move through, or does that sound good? Or would you like me to read out a few options to you? You can pick a few. Okay, great. Yeah, I can start if that's okay, Jade and Kylia. Okay. Um, so uh, Alexis ha you know, has a lot of great questions. I'm going to answer the, the first one. I started typing it, but I realized it'd probably be better to answer it verbally. Um, so the point of sale rebates are going to be administered by states and tribes. That essentially means that the state or tribe is going to like hold the money. Um, the intent is for that state to be like the bank of rebates. So when someone like like myself, let's say I'm going to, uh, you know, a retail store to buy a heat pump. Uh, the intent is for, you know, when I'm at the counter purchasing a heat pump, that that so like I don't know like uh, where where I live, there's something called like Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, if I'm at the store buying a heat pump there, and I'm at the counter at the register. I would show that I my income is eligible to receive a rebate. And uh, they're supposed to be able to tell uh, whether or not I qualify for a rebate, and if so, how much, and then deduct that from the cost of my purchase. That deduction would be subsidized on the back end. So the retailer and the tribe or the state would have an agreement to, to receive that rebate. Um, so that the cost is fully covered, just part of it's coming from me, the other part's coming from the tribe, the state. Um, so I think there's two scenarios to, to mention here, and that is if uh, you live on, you know, a tri tribal land, then your rebates will be administered by your tribe. Um, and again, those tribes have not been named yet. And I think unfortunately that means that not all tribes will have access, uh, but we are working to make sure that we can get more resources uh, for these types of programs. The other scenario is if you are um, like a member of an indigenous community, but are also um, also like have access to it, like a state, right? And so the state in theory, like you could also get um, a rebate, you know, let's say you're in, you know, New Mexico, um, you could go to, you know, a New Mexican hardware store, buy a heat pump and still get your, um, uh, your point of sale rebate. They are not, there's no, there's no requirement that they need to ask for, uh, your citizenship or anything like that. So, um, and we're going to make sure that there's no requirements like that. Um, so they're not going to ask you who you are. Um, all they all they need to know is is your income, um, or to show that some some way to to prove that your your income is 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 eligible. Um, I hope Alexis uh, that that was helpful. Uh, but if not, you can follow up with another question. Um, Gonna say I answered that one live. Um, anonymous attendee asked, "How can they get the word out about the IRA in both the urban area in which they live uh, and related reservation communities?" I think, um, and Jay would be interested in your perspective here too. But really, just talking about it, talking about the fact that these resources and incentives are coming. Um, some some people only hear about things through word of mouth, so I think that makes each one of us. Uh, that that much more important uh, in making sure that people are aware of, of the resources that are in their electric bank account. You have thoughts there, Jay, too? Yeah, um, we're talking about the, how do we get the word out, yes? Yeah. Well, 
I'm going to drop a toolkit. Um, this was mostly made for organizations, but I think um, it's it's totally fine if you as an individual want to amplify because, yeah, you may know someone who um, works in the tribe or works with a nonprofit who should know about this. And um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, especially in in rural communities, it's it's important to yeah really do the um, as as one of my mentors say says uh, Judith LeBlanc um, moccasins on the ground just spreading the word um, you know at your chapter house meetings at um, community gatherings uh, you know it's it's unglamorous to talk about policy. Uh, uh, or big policy packages, but uh, you know this funding is is going to be a game changer for our communities. And I'll just say something I forgot to mention in my little bit is that a lot of the times, and we've seen it with like the CARES Act, we've see we see it all the time with tribal um, the tribal energy loan guarantee program that's within the DOI. That these programs often go underutilized. Uh, because, and I bring up the CARES Act because that was kind of just a um, an example as far as uh, tribes holding these uh, large investments and, and really needing support. So we're highly aware of the technical assistance that's needed. We're going to be doing our best um, as an organization that can help with that end of things. But, um, you know, outreach is a big deal. Uh, the government is very limited in their ability to do outreach. Uh, they they don't really have the best platforms. Like their websites aren't really great. Um, they're they're not like social media, <laughs> sa uh, you know, savvy folks. I mean, I'm sure they are as individuals, but just as agencies, you know, it, they don't really do a great job of spreading the word, and so. Um, for better or worse, it's it's really on us as as community members, as organizations, to get the word out to our folks. Um, and and that's yeah. I hope that we can we can all kind of take that uh, seriously, especially for some of these programs that you know can directly benefit um, people who are on the front lines of climate change. Um, yeah, excuse me, that was a great answer. Um, what are, uh, so Alexis asked about the 75% of the unelectrified homes on tribal lands. Uh, I'm assuming that means that there, those homes don't have any electricity, but you want to confirm that, Jane? Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, so no electricity, they, they could be getting power via a generator. They could be getting power, uh, via, um yeah uh another another source of energy you know there's there's like this uh, some of us from um the southwest region know that you know it was not uncommon for uh Diné or Navajo folks to you know burn actual coal in the house to provide heat um and so which is, uh, yeah, really hard uh, and a really um, uh, toxic way to get, um, I mean, as far as like the air pollution in the house. Um, but sometimes that's what people just had access to. So um, yeah, and, and also using generators, that's really expensive or can be the cost of gas is very unreliable, especially these days. So um, yeah, they may be getting energy some other way. Uh, it's really hard to have data on that. It's really hard to, um, for lots of different reasons, this is a, this could be a whole other webinar, but it's hard to poll or collect data in Indian country. Uh, but so far, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, 75% is, is about the energy, um, or the, that, that source of energy, as far as we know. Awesome. Um, Carmen asked, what plans are in place to address the rise in cost to the consumer for retrofitted appliances? 
Uh, I would say these rebates are intended to be uh, a solution. You know, it's not the solution. It's not, um, and it's not even a, a, a long lasting solution at that. Um, there is a finite amount of, amount of money that's available through 2031. Um, and we anticipate that, the, you know, these rebates are going to go very quickly. Uh, and so uh, one thing that I know I'll be involved in and would, would welcome and would love Indian Collectives Partnership here too is getting more, more resources for these rebates in the future um, uh, and extending. Uh, there are also consumer tax credits that uh, I'm not sure if uh, tri tribal uh, and native uh, communities can access. Um, but I'm, I'm working on getting clarity on that right now, but if not, then there's a whole, a whole bunch of other fixes that I think can influence our next ask, you know, for the, the time in which we have, uh, for which, you know, Congress is able to appropriate more money for some of these programs. Um, so, uh, Renea. Uh, I hope, I'm sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, is asking what is meant by Indigenous communities? Does this include Indigenous-led community-based organizations? I think that it really, that really does depend on the program. So for the, uh, for the point of sale rebates, for example, those are like tribal governments that will ultimately be the holder of the funds, but will be accessible to consumers, all consumers. Uh, some provision like programs like the <clears throat> the um, like the greenhouse gas reduction fund, which is you know like the green bank. That is <clears throat> excuse me. That is for uh, disadvantaged communities, uh, which includes uh, indigenous and tribal communities. But beyond that, we don't have a, a a clear definition to work with, and that's actually one of the things that. Uh, we've commented on to, for them to be clear about naming who's eligible um, and who actually falls within those terms. Uh, and uh, I know Jade has been like super instrumental in helping helping me understand what that really means and how we can be supportive of uh, getting uh, non-recognized tribes uh, and, and tribal individuals uh, to be eligible for some of these incentives. So thank you, Jade. Yeah, of course. Um, and I think just to mention that there are some strides happening. Um, not, I don't want to segue too far from IRA. That's why we're here tonight. But I'm um, just sharing this link here because it is helpful for this audience to know that um, there is an interesting partnership uh, that was just announced with the Interior Department and Natives in Philanthropy um, to work more closely around driving resources for tribal-led conservation, um, education, and economic development. Um, so look into this new partnership. This is definitely meant to support um, community-based organizations, indigenous or native-led nonprofits, um, and also um, indigenous uh, CDFIs, which are community development financial institutions. Awesome. Ian is asking about for funds that allow tribal governments to buy back land from uh, non-governmental organizations or private businesses or non-native landowners who don't want to give the land back. I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I can try to clarify that or ver verify that, but I. I don't think so. I didn't see that um, in my read. Uh, Alexis is asking about. Uh, oh. Just a follow up on the the rebates questions. Uh, um, yeah, I agree, Alexis. The grant, grant grants would be easier for sure, uh, but because of the grant grants instead of rebates would be easier. Um, but that just that's the way that the legislation was written, um, and there, there's not much that I think there's not much we can do about that piece of it. So uh, that it's unfortunate. Uh, so Faith is asking about tribal uh, non-governmental organizations or nonprofits being eligible for funds. 
uh, nonprofits are uh, eligible for some funds. Um, we're working on uh, a fact sheet on on that specific thing, recognizing the importance that nonprofits pl play and community-based organizations play uh, in providing critical services for for, uh, for our communities. Um, and so this, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act does provide some resources to help nonprofits to do that. Uh, and when when we are through with that uh, fact sheet, we can send it to, to you, Jade and Kailea, um, to share with folks. Um, Claire is asking about uh, the federal agencies that will be the grantors for certain programs. Yeah, can um so that information is in the uh the the resource, the memo that Indian Collective and Rewiring America uh published. Um and I think we we have that link. But all of the programs that I talked about today uh can be found in that in that memo, which includes the administering federal agency. Uh but nonetheless, if you have um questions about that. Uh, I'm, you know, feel free to reach out to, to Jade and Kailea, who I think will have that information too, but I'm also, I also can be a resource uh, as well. Um, and sorry, Jade and Kailea, you start getting a lot of emails. I'm sure you do that. You get that anyway. <laughs> uh, Alexis asking a lot of great questions. Um, so the, uh, Alexis is asking about workforce, um, being a limiting factor in the clean energy transition, uh, which is exactly true. It's it's very true. Um, there is money uh, in uh, the Inflation Reduction Act for workforce development. Uh, it's two hundred million dollars uh, that will also go to states. I don't think that that includes tribes, um, but I will verify that. But you're you're absolutely right. There needs to be more money for workforce development. And, and, you know, I mentioned sort of the next wave of advocacy being, you know, uh, implementing the Inflation Reduction Act right now, but also uh, fixing some of the, um, or adding some resources to uh, groups that did not get their fair share within the bill. Uh, but I think another piece of that is more money for workforce development. $200 million is not enough. Um, and we there needs to be more more resources there for workforce development. So that's going to be another part of uh, the platform going forward. Um, so anonymous attendee asks if we will be creating a clearinghouse where the draft rules and regulations related to new programs can be found for the purpose of commenting facilitating and facilitating commenting by communities. I'm so glad whoever asked that asked that because uh, I feel like most of my job recently has been trying to get people uh, to and people engaged uh, that want to be uh, in the public commenting uh, process. Um, so I'm happy to say, uh, and I can uh, send my email or um, that my email can be shared. If you are someone that is interested in engaging uh, and, and making your your voice heard, or at least hearing what uh, Jay Kale and I are are, are up to with our comments, uh, definitely email me, and we can share that with you. Um, and if you're an individual, you can sign on. If you're part of an organization and you want to sign on, you can you can do that too. Um, and if you want to play an active role in in, in uh, drafting comments, you're welcome to do that as well. I think. Our goal is really to make it as accessible uh, as possible for people to, to make their voices heard. And I think that also addresses Noreen's question. So how can okay. others, um, how can we and others, um, sorry, how can we be involved in the public comment um, is essentially the question. And so, yeah, I would just, yeah, oh, okay. just emphasize what you shared, um, Jamal, just, um, if, yeah, if you're interested to work with us as far as um, public comments from, you know, uh, your role in an organization, please reach out to us. Um, otherwise, 
I think we're, yeah, we're learning how best to help communities navigate even that process because it's not necessarily straightforward. The um, regulations.gov website is another website that is just uh, poorly structured and <laughs> built. Um, but when these when these deadlines come come around, um, you know, just be sure to uh, just follow us, engage online, uh, get our newsletter because um, at least for myself, it's it's definitely a major priority to keep our communities, especially tribes, especially uh, native and indigenous organizations, um, aware of all of these different public comment periods. Yeah, thanks, Jade. Um, where are we? Is there a, uh, I think, yeah, is there potential for fraud if indigenous citizenship is not validated, which increases the potential to not reach the intended communities? I think what's important, um, I, I perceive that, that that question is largely about the rebate programs, but it could be about other programs too. And when when the when the bill says that there's a resource or incentive for you know tribal communities or indigenous or native communities, um, there usually is a intermediary that I think is intended to help identify those communities. So for the rebates, for example, the the way that we will know that those rebates are going to tribal communities. Um, and I think there's an assumption here, so I'll just caveat that. But the way that we know is by funneling those rebates through a tribal government. So that is sort of the way of, of checking whether uh, the, the funds are reaching the intended communities. Um, the resources for, let's say, like the disadvantaged communities that's mentioned in the bill, um, there's a lot, and Jay was sort of talking about this too, but there's a lot of discussion around how we're defining disadvantaged. Um, and the reason that's important, I don't think I mentioned this, uh, I'm not sure if Jay did either, is because the, you know, the Biden administration has a, an executive order directing 40% uh, of uh, federal resources, certain federal resources to be, uh, to benefit disadvantaged communities, which is intended to place uh um uh what's the word i'm looking for like a threshold for because typically when when resources are deployed it's like first come first serve and oftentimes our communities are you know don't are, aren't prepared to apply so this threshold is intended to be essentially like a set aside for disadvantaged communities um and not to say that the other 60 percent can't also go to disadvantaged communities uh, but at least that 40% is, is intended to do that. So the definition of disadvantaged communities becomes really important because who, who's eligible for that set aside, that 40%. Um, and I, I, all that to say, yes, there, I think there is potential for fraud, but I think I would be, uh, I would want to lean on you all to understand how, uh, how one could prevent that or like how you would want uh, your ident like your identities to be verified uh, to ensure that the, those benefits are actually reaching your communities. Um, I don't have insight on that. So I would, I would love your, your all's feedback. on Yeah. I think this is another place where it's important to engage tribes. Um, you know, we all know that our, our, our tribes can sometimes um, be yeah, have issues with capacity. And so maybe, you know, they're not even aware of some of these nuances. Um, and so, yeah, I think if you have a relationship with your tribal council, your, um, you know, folks who are uh, employees at the tribe, um, you know, who work in programs, uh, you know, that are around issues like environmental, like there's forestry programs, there's environmental programs, there's energy programs within various tribes. So, you know, speaking to those folks um, and building those relationships. Um, 
and and starting to see you know are they aware are you know are they yeah what what plans are in place what strategies are in place um i i think that that's that work can be really impactful especially when it comes to when it comes to this yeah agreed there um renee i accidentally uh, addressed your question or I, I said that i addressed your question when i didn't already uh, so i'm going back to it uh you you're refer you are rephrasing your question and wondering if indigenous-led community-based organizations leading an indigenous climate justice project in portland oregon <laughs> that will be doing mitigation restoration and conservation would you be applying to the state or can you apply as uh, are you as a CBO applied? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so for, sorry, one second. Uh, so for uh, the, uh, the for the rebate programs, and I'm just harping on the rebate programs because I really want you all to know that those are available. Um, those are intended to be consumer facing. Um, and I believe that nonprofits can claim the rebate on behalf of and sort of pass on the the, the lower cost to or um, claim the uh, the rebate if you're in, if you're installing qualifying technologies for an income eligible uh, or an eligible uh, household. So the how so in that scenario, like the actual household would, would apply, but could go could um go through the nonprofit so or the nonprofit could apply to the state on behalf of the or the individual or the household so in that scenario you as a nonprofit could apply on behalf of the household to the state um there are some programs uh like <clears throat> i think the greenhouse gas reduction fund uh the direct funding from that program is intended to go to like financing entities like community development financing institutions uh, or green banks but those green banks are going to be housing uh the revolving loan fund so for a project you as a nonprofit could apply to to your local community development financing institution or your local green bank if you have one uh, or your regional green bank if you have one uh to advance your project. Um, so those are like two examples and it really just depends. I'm, I'm happy to maybe chat with you more offline if if that's helpful. Yeah, and then just, um, yeah, researching, looking into indigenous um, or native led um, CDFIs, so financial institutions uh, is, yeah, this is another point of just yeah building building relationships ndn is a cdfi we have that capacity in our ecosystem um that's why we are a collective we are multiple arms um so one arm of the organization or the collective rather is a cdfi um so we're we're really aware of how we can support our communities with loans or working alongside or working in partnership with, um, you know, states or tribes around uh, managing these, these dollars. But there's OISTA, there is, um, oh man, I'm blanking on the, the number of CDFIs out there, but I know that there are over a hundred. So um, yeah, researching um, native led CDFIs um, is, is a good next step as well. Okay, um, I think we have two more questions. Uh, Wendelin's talking about the Section 48 investment tax credit uh, and is just pointing out that there uh, is the advanced energy uh, manufacturing tax credit that has a special carve out for energy transition communities, um, which is a great flag. Uh, what that means, what energy transition communities, um, this isn't a word for word definition, but how I view it are communities across the country that have had significant significant reliance on fossil the on the fossil fuel industry and you know and where that um where those jobs may be going away uh because of the transition to, to renewable energy um 
the this tax credit is meant to direct new investment in things like wind, solar, uh, or other sort of massive projects that are intended to create uh, jobs for for members of those communities. So um, the the set aside for energy communities is is I think really about directing jobs you know to those communities. Um, yeah, and then the comments are, you know, they have varying due dates. So to date, we've had uh, several comment periods that have passed us, such as the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, which we were fortunate to work with Indian Collective on. Um, but some are upcoming. So the EPA, some a lot of the, the Environmental Protection Agency programs, so the most of the ones that I, I mentioned that uh, referred to air pollution reduction. Um, so like for ports or general air pollution reduction or the climate pollution reduction grants, like those are, those programs have comment periods coming up in January. I think January, <laughs> there you go. You're way ahead of me. Uh, but yeah, so Jay just posted all of the various, uh, the, all six of the requests for information or public comments that are due January 18th, um, which is kind of mean that they have all of those due on the same day. Uh, but I think we're we're trying to figure out if we can partner or share some of that load. But if you if you're interested in uh, participating, definitely reach out to us and we can get you plugged in uh, in, in any way that that works for you. Um, it could be minimal engagement. You just want to sign on. Or you just want to know what we're talking about. Like all of all of it is 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 welcome. Um, so the answer is no. Not all of the comments are due before December thirty first. Uh, it's really sort of like rolling whenever the agency issues the you know the or publishes the questions that they're they want to ask about the program. Yeah, and I'm trying to pull. Um... Uh, an actual link because those those were hyperlinked. We actually shared those comments uh, or those comment periods in a recent newsletter. So uh, again, I'm not I'm not trying to like grow our list here. <laughs> I'm really trying to like encourage uh, signing up for our newsletter because this is where we broadcast a lot of um, the updates around these uh, engagement periods or these public comment periods. Um, yeah, so if you're not already signed up to either uh, Rewiring America's newsletter or NDN's, um, I recommend that. I'll, I'll drop links to our websites again. Um, and yeah, like Jamal said, we're here to um, partner or collaborate on those public comment periods. Um, and just to address this last comment, uh, for Treasury, which has to do with the tax credits, um, yes, I think a lot of those comments are due up up to December 31st. So for Treasury, uh, that is correct. December 31st is the deadline. And that really is because some of these tax credits are will be live, you know, January 1st, 2023. So they I, the Treasury really needs to get guidance out. So that people can understand how to access these credits or like the types of requirements they need uh, to follow in order to actually get their credit when they file their taxes. So thanks for that flag, uh, anonymous attendee. Awesome. Well, I think we got through all the questions. Thanks, folks, for staying, yeah, well beyond the the hour. Um I, there was a question that did come up around how can you access this recording? Um, we have set up the webinar so that you will be getting a follow-up email in a couple days with the recording information. Also, again, one last shameless plug for the newsletter because we will share a newsletter next week and it will have the recording in it. So uh, there you go. Over to you, Kailea, to wrap us up. Yeah, you know, we're we're over time, but just wanting to say thank you. Oh yeah, there's our book, <laughs> Required Reading. Um, but wanting to just um, appreciate Jade and Jamal for taking the time to um, share about all of the different 
exciting uh, opportunities that are coming our way for for funding and um you know i you all heard there's some there's going to be some follow-up material available that will automatically go to your emails inboxes and um i think you know i think one of the biggest takeaways that i i want to just put out to everyone is that we are really available um, both of our organizations are available um, the individuals that are on this panel are available for conversation to um, take further you know questions um, to hash out public comments together so um, just wanting to remind people that um, we're we're here to collaborate and we're here to work together. Um, wanting to wish you all a really restorative weekend. It is Friday evening. Thank you for um, taking the extra time to hang out with us. And um, we will certainly be in touch via your inbox. And that is it. Bye for now, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have Bye, everyone. Thank you, Jade. Thank you, Kylie. I really appreciate y'all. <laughs>